The catch up. The catch up. The catch up. Monday morning. Catch up. Thank you guys. Welcome to Monday Morning Catch Up, a new segment here in our CBC Teens podcast where we catch you up on the messages from Sunday. These are extremely abbreviated notes as we encourage you to meditate and think about what was preached. We also catch you up in a new segment entitled Ron Like the Wind. More on that in a moment. Now, on Sunday morning, Pastor Pete preached a message entitled Not Far from the Kingdom out of Mark 12, 28 to 34. The Bible says, Mark 12, 34, and when Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, this is the scribe asking Christ a question, he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God, and no man after that durst ask him any questions. Christ has this really neat encounter uh, with this scribe, and uh, point number one, even though the scribes were a thorn in the side of Christ's ministry, Jesus Christ, number one, will accept anyone into his kingdom, which is really a wonderful truth even though the scribes were historically a thorn in Christ's ministry. This particular scribe ended up being a type of gentleman. They had this really wonderful uh, conversation with mutual respect in this conversation, which is a dying fashion in our society. And and the Lord showed him respect, and the scribe showed him respect. Um, The other point that Pastor Pete brought up is the fact that titles that you have borne in the past do not preclude you from Christ's kingdom. Uh, Number two, sincere questions deserve sincere answers. We all know the type of question that when it's asked in a certain uh, sarcastic way, that sometimes it makes us wonder how sincere that person really is. So, But this scribe had a very sincere, had a, had a deep sincerity about himself. So the truth is, we should all be ready to answer sincere questions as Christians, as believers in Christ. Um, the Lord answers his question, and there's an emphasis on the supremacy of God. There's an emphasis on the relationship, on a relationship with God. And there's an emphasis upon uh, respect towards your fellow man. Is that we are to love the Lord thy God um, with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. And the Bible says the second commandment is like unto it. We need to be able to answer questions that are sincere in a sincere way. And number three, closeness to the kingdom does not indicate citizenship. And the point is our citizenship is found in Christ. I encourage you to go back and uh, maybe even listen to it again if you didn't uh, catch uh, some of those points there. And now for an exciting uh, segment entitled Ron Like the Wind. And it's the barely edited Monday morning drive to the bank to drop off the offering. Along the way, we will interview, we will interview Brother Ron Van Kirk for his unique perspective on politics, business, and nonsense. Brother Ron, thanks for coming to this to your uh, segment of your own show. I don't really have a choice, but you're welcome. Well, what a Obviously, pleasure. Obviously, our life is very different at this time, but we've both... I mean, we've talked about this, you know, just between you and me, but we've both taken this coronavirus pretty seriously. Um, our hands are very chapped, and uh, uh, basically we can scrub down any varnish on wood at this point uh, with the amount of times that we've washed our hands and things like that. But would you say at some point this has been politicized? Has it been politicized? And when did that happen, in your opinion? Yes, I think that, unfortunately, everything in our society today is politicized to a certain extent. Um, when I don't really know how to answer that question. Um, I'm really bad at this thing. <laughs> it's going all over the place. That's okay. Um, yes, you know, I think there are some just like anything else. Some have made it about politics and some haven't. Mm. Uh, you know, unfortunately, with President Trump, he's you know kind of taking the leadership on this. Obviously, there are those out there. No matter what he says or does, they're gonna you know downplay it or try to criticize it. As far as Ohio goes, I think our governor has done a really good job of not politicizing it. Yeah. I don't necessarily agree with all the decisions that he's made, him and Dr. Acton have made, but at the same time, I think they truly are looking out for the welfare and well-being of, you know, of our people. Yeah. Um, as far as the local level, um, there's really not a whole lot that cities can do. Our council did give our mayor some leeway about as far as hiring and firing practices go, but we really take our cue from the state when it, when it involves you know, opening and closing of businesses. And, um, you know, we saw at our church on uh, Easter Sunday that we were able to have our Easter drive-in service mm-hmm. and where you had some cities and states that were outlawing that and actually issuing people tickets for doing that. We actually had our police department that actually helped with the traffic on that day. Yeah, that was So, great. you know, um, I just think it depends on where you're at. Um, I, I would like to think that most of our leaders are not responding that way, but, you know, only time will tell. History will determine that. We really won't right now. And do you think it's possible you can clear for the record the drone that was at our drive-in service 
Was that from the uh, state officials or government officials, or was that from somebody else? Well, as I mentioned in both services, or I think Pastor Pete actually mentioned the first service, <laughs> that drone was actually owned by Ryan Schweitzer, who okay. was very good with uh, that piece of technology. And, and neither of us really were against the shutdown at the forefront, and I wouldn't even say that we're against it now necessarily, but, but what would be the regional impact and what would be the national uh, financial impact of the shutdown? Well, I think that it's going to be severe at every level. I, you know, you don't you don't shut down an economy our size for a month and there not be cascading effects. I mean, you're seeing it already. Unemployment at 22 million in a matter of just three weeks. Mm. Um, thankfully, at least in the state of Ohio, most of the things that that we've been asked to do have been voluntary. Mm. Uh, for example, you know, uh, church services they've asked us not to have them, but we haven't forbidden us from having them. Uh, I don't know of anyone in the state of Ohio that's been issued citations for having their business open. I think for the most part, people have voluntarily closed based upon the advice given by our leaders. However, I think that's going to change very rapidly if things don't start to open up pretty quickly. May 1st has kind of been the date that our governor has set, and I think you're going to start seeing things open up. And even if you don't see them open up legally, I think you're going to start seeing people that have had enough and they have to make a living. Now, as far as the economic impact goes, Again, only history will tell that. No one that's alive right now has ever experienced anything like this. We, the closest to this would have been the pandemic back in 1917 or 1918 with the Spanish flu. But of course, if there's anyone still alive at those from those days, they're they're very very we're very very young at that time. We have to get through this thing first before we can start hashing that stuff out. You know, if you just have a casual conversation with anyone in town, ultimately, I think because the restaurant industry is so. Uh, so woven into Cleveland's culture. I, I don't know the exact number of how many restaurants are out there. I've heard 10, I've heard 15,000 overall Cleveland restaurants. What will be the impact on those types of industries? Well, I think the bottom line is that some of them will never reopen. Yeah, I, I just think that's really the, sad. it is sad, but um, the the restaurant industry is a very competitive industry. As you said, 10, 15,000, whatever that number is. And the bottom line is that there's just gonna be some restaurants that you know they are gonna go bankrupt during this situation. They're never gonna be able to open again. Um, you know, my hope through all of this is that, you know, Americans learn lessons from this. We're very, at least I am in my, you know, teaching my classes that very debt conscious about how you need to set money aside, prepare for an emergency. You don't know what that emergency is, but it's going to come at some point. And you've seen in America that a lot of people have not taken responsibility for that. And so within a week, many people are already struggling. And so mm. um, I think coming from this, you're going to see people that are a little more uh, conscientious about saving for an unprecedented event um, and I think that restaurants you know because they live up they make money at such a small profit margin yeah. if they don't have money set aside for you know 45 days or something like that they're just they're not going to survive and unfortunately I think many of them in Cleveland are, are not and but I guess we will see do you think that's going to be the new standard as far as okay so if I want to order make have open up some sort of business you know just in the spirit of entrepreneurial you know, entrepreneurial spirit do you think people will set aside even more, I mean, double their profit margins uh, in the future so nothing like this happens again? I think you'll you'll have people that try. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, like I said, in the restaurant business, because they're, they're, there's so little margin for error yeah. uh, when it comes to that, that it's not entirely possible. And that's why, that's why I think you're going to see a lot of these mom and pop restaurants go out because they just, they, they don't have that kind of cash flow. You think your franchises will be okay? You know, your, um, you know, your Applebee's of the world, you know, restaurants like that. Uh, but your local restaurants, where I know you like to frequent, uh, they're they're going to have a hard time coming out of this, I think. Yeah. And you're already seeing it, you know, in like some stores that were already on life support, like a J.C. Penney or a Sears. Yeah. Uh, if they come out of this still afloat, I'd be shocked. Yeah. You know, I want to circle back to one other thing that you said. Uh, as far as uh, this is a moment ago when you were talking about uh, the drive-in service at the church and, and us working hand in hand with law enforcement officials in the city of Brooklyn. Can you explain the difference between an order and a law? Because uh, this has been a, a blurry line, I think, across conversational points. Well, uh, there are lawyers that can make lots of money to dif differentiate that. Um, what people, most people don't realize is they keep saying that Governor DeWine issued this shutdown, Governor DeWine passed, you know, wrote this executive order, and that's simply not the case. Uh, all of this is coming from um, the uh, Health and Human Services Director version of that in Ohio, and that would be Dr. Amy Acton. Mm. And the reason for that is, is because Governor DeWine does not have the constitutional power to do to shut things down. Mm. Uh, Governor DeWine can't tell a restaurant they can't open. He can't tell a church you can only have ten people there. He can't do that. 
However, carved out inside the Ohio Revised Code is a is a I think it's code 3710 or something like that that gives the Health and Human Services Director in the state a lot of power to basically shut things down like she's done for a health reasons. Now, to my knowledge, it's only ever been used locally. I don't know if it's ever been used like at a state level like this, mm. but I think you're going to see a lot of that revisited, uh, you know, whenever this thing we come through this because a lot of people, have, oh, where's it going there? A lot of people have said that, you know, that this has been an overreaction and that, um, you know, that the legislature needs to come back and to do their job and we'll see whether that actually happens or not. All right. Now, as a Clevelander, uh, I'm required in my fiber to hate the Steelers. Yes, uh, I've learned. The one thing I've learned in the 17 years I've lived here is that. Right. I'm, I'm required by law, I think. It's it's an order by the state <laughs> to hate the Steelers. But I'd like to ask a Steelers fan who their least favorite Steelers players is. Ooh, least favorite Least Steelers. favorite Steelers. Because really, Steelers. I mean, we might root for the team and the jersey itself. you know. But at the end of the day, there are some players that sometimes make it onto the roster on any level of sports that we just despise as fans. All right. Well, I will tell you, this is going to be a controversial name. And my fellow Steelers fan here in Cleveland, Matt Lodi, if he sees this, will probably blow a gasket, but that's okay. <laughs> I will give you the name, and I'll tell you why. Uh, my least favorite Steeler would be a quarterback uh, from the 1990s by the name of Neil O'Donnell. Hmm. Now, Lodi, if you're watching this, relax. I'm going to explain why. <laughs> so, being from Pittsburgh, I understand the pain of Cleveland fans in many ways because for most of my lifetime, uh, there was a um, drought of championships. And so, finally, in the early 90s, uh, the Pirates lost three straight National League Division Series to go to the World Series, so they didn't get to go there. The Penguins didn't win a couple in 91-92, but the Steelers, Pittsburgh, much like Cleveland, is a football town. Mm -hmm. So in 1995, I, was, I think I was a freshman or sophomore in high school, um, the Steelers went to the Super Bowl. They were playing the Dallas Cowboys, and Neil O'Donnell was their quarterback. Well, he was an average quarterback, I would say, for the most part, uh, but he did lead in the Super Bowl. But it was their defense, really, that got them there. Hmm. And in that Super Bowl, he threw not one, but two interceptions to the exact same guy. And literally, you can go watch the tape, the guy never moved. He literally, it looked like he threw it right to him. Now, people would argue, well, the, the receiver ran the wrong route. Maybe, maybe not. But it looked bad. Yeah. And they had a really good shot at winning the Super Bowl that year, and they lost because of those two interceptions. And so, therefore... Neil O'Donnell goes down as my least favorite Steeler ever. That was 91? 95. 90, okay, 95. I, I think yeah, it said 91. I was like, man, I wasn't even conscious in 91. <laughs> no, 95. I wasn't even a sentient human in 91. <laughs> yeah, 95. So. Very good. Well, that concludes our first edition of Ron Like the Wind. So I hope you enjoyed that. So, Ron, thanks for stopping by uh, the drop-off to the uh, church offering. My pleasure. All right, thank you. Have a good day. The evening mess was a message entitled Grace and Truth Under Trial. Our... Uh, theme this year at Cleveland Baptist Church is grace and truth out of John uh, 1 14 the Bible says and the word was made flesh that's Jesus and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth and the point that Pastor Pete was making the Bible doesn't give a ton of detail about the appearance of our Lord and Savior but what it does say is that Christ himself was full of grace and full of truth so the message itself dealt with how you and I could be demonstrating grace and truth in a trial. So, uh, number one, uh, we have not passed this way before, sort of an implication on our current circumstances of the COVID-19 uh, virus. Joshua 3.4 says this much. Number two was a really interesting point I never thought of out of Job 42. Um, the Bible says that Job needed comforting after he was restored. I, I never thought of that, which is really an interesting point. But uh, number two, the point was that no trial lasts forever, but every trial produces change. Is that each trial that you and I march through, that it will change us uh, as a result of it. And so uh, it's important that we change uh, for the good and that we conform ourselves to the image of the Son. Number three, compassion during a trial gives expanded opportunity to share the gospel. And uh, Pastor Pete took us to John chapter 4, verses 6 through 7, where the Lord is meeting the woman at the well. And uh, he shares uh, the love of Christ to her and that she too could be saved, uh, which is really a wonderful truth. And look, at a time like this, we all should be showing compassion uh, towards our fellow man. And so that prayerfully that they would see uh, what's so wonderful about being a Christian 
and uh, it gives us greater influence in this world. So this concludes the Monday morning catch-up. Have a great start to the week. Catch up!